Hey everybody. Today we're talking a little bit about the structure of R functions and how they're evaluated. Understanding these things a little bit better will help you pre will help prevent you from being confused by unexpected output from functions, maybe even ones that you wrote yourself. This is a follow-up to another vid I did recently introducing writing your own R functions. If you don't have any experience with that yet, you might want to start with that other video. I'll throw a link up top. In that vid, I wrote a bunch of functions, including keep top spec, keep top special, which takes a vector of values and a cutoff value. And it essentially filters that vector to only give you back values from that vector that are larger than that cutoff. I also specified a, a default value for cutoff in case uh, the user doesn't specify one. This function is going to default to taking the average of the values vector as its cutoff. Now there are three components to every R function and I'm going to run through them one at a time. Um, the first one is the formals. And we can see the formals with the formals command. Inside you put the name of the function that you're interested in. So the formals for the keep top spec function are vals and cutoff. So these are just literally the arguments of the function. Like what sort of things is the function formally expecting to be told? And uh, notice we've got this nice dollar sign notation familiar to us as R users from data frames and lists. We can also see the default value for cutoff here is mean values. The next element of a function is the body, so the actual code that defines it. And we can see that with body. And we can put the name of the function in there, keep top spec. And there it is. So you can see the actual code that's inside is this uh, subsetting operation that I did on this vector vals. Notice that the comment was not included in the body output. This is sort of a, a, a kind of public facing uh, printout for the function. You can see everything together with the view command. Just put the name of the function in there, keep top spec. Notice that autofill tried to give me these, uh, these, this set of parentheses at the end of keep top spec. If I execute that right now, I get an error because uh, it's thinking I want to evaluate the keep top spec function, which isn't really what I want. So let's take those parentheses out. There we go. So keep top spec got opened up in my viewer here, and I can see um, the actual definition, the literal code that was used to define this function. Now, formals, body, and view can all be applied to functions that come with R. So for instance, we can take a look at, uh, uh, let's look at the which function. And there you go. You can see the definition of the which function. And we can see the body, for instance, as well. And in case you don't remember what which does, I'm going to pull up the help file for you. Which indices of a vector are true? So you're supposed to pass it a logical vector, um, and then it's going to give you back just the numbers of the indices for which it's true. So that's just an aside there. OK. Now, if you are using body or formals or view with these um, functions that come with R, you may sometimes get some surprising results. So let's try seeing the body of is.na just as an illustration of this. And we got the body of that function is null, which of course we know not to be the case. We use is.na all the time. A clue to this comes when we do type of is.na. It's a built-in function which uh, in this case means that it's hard-coded in C. There's not actually any R code in the is.na function. So that's why we're getting no body out. By the way, let's look at the type of our original function, keep top spec. We get that this is of type closure. And we'll get the same thing also if we do it for um, a function like which. Um, which is one of those R functions that's you know actually written in R. So type closure just means that it's a function. A fun an object of type closure in R is just a function and vice versa. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the meaning of that term in a little bit, but fundamentally in R it's just synonymous with function. At some point in your career, I'm sure you've gotten the error. Object of type closure is not subsettable basically saying a function is not subsettable, which is pretty obvious if you think about it there. 
Okay, so we've talked about the body of a function. We've talked about the formals of a function. The last thing we need to do is to talk about the environment component of a function. And this is something that we don't see explicitly. This is just kind of the place where everything that the function does lives as it's doing the evaluation. So to see the environment, I want to do a few examples. I'm going to start by writing a really simple function. I'm going to call it uh, just y. And uh, it's a function, of course. It's not going to have any arguments. It's going to assign y to be 4, and then it's going to print out y. Remember, functions in R return the last expression evaluated. So in this case, it's going to return y. At least that's the default behavior. All right, and so uh, if we run just y, things aren't surprising, of course. We're going to get 4 out. Uh, I didn't actually define the function. I typed it, but didn't execute it. <laughs> there we go. There we go. We get 4 out for real this time. So that's not surprising. The um, first potentially surprising behavior I want to draw your attention to um, in this vid is what happens if we try now to evaluate y here in the console. Object y not found. Now, at first, that might seem counterintuitive. When we evaluated or when we executed just y, it assigned y to be 4 that before printing it out. And so you would think we should get 4 here. So um, the reason functions are called objects of type closure is because they enclose their environment. Sort of what happens inside this function stays inside that function. So y is defined to be 4 here. But once we're outside of that function's environment, once the function's done executing, that assignment is forgotten. So um, y is 4 inside of this local environment, but it does not exist inside the global environment. Uh, let's see here. What happens if we assign y to be a different number, like 9, and then rerun this function? So now I have y with two different definitions, 9 in the global environment and 4 in the function environment. The fact is that the local environment is sort of winning here, right? Um, it's the y being assigned to be 4 inside the function is sort of overriding the y being assigned to be 9 outside of the function. Now, if I go back and print y at the end, it's 9 again. Sort of this y is kind of different from this y. It's a, it's a locally defined y only. Okay, great. Um, Next, I want to do um, an even simpler function. Let's call this, uh, how about simpler y? And that's going to be a function. Again, no arguments. And all it's going to do is return y. OK, by the way, I could have just written this all on one line. There's no reason I need to break it up like this. That's probably just habit for me. And I need to execute that so that it's in my uh, my environment. And uh, now let's see what happens if I do simpler y. So y is not defined inside this local environment. So maybe we were expecting to get an error, object y not found. So what happened here is that when r didn't find y inside the function environment, that closed environment, it then went, then went one level up and looked in the global environment. And of course, in the global environment, y is defined to be 9. So that's what it returned here. So there's kind of a, a, an order in which r is looking for the value of y. It starts at the function environment and then starts um, going up from there. Now, um, let's see here. So we got 9 out. One other behavior I want to illustrate before I move on is what happens if I reassign y yet again. Let's let y be 10. And now let's rerun simpler y. And we get 10 out. So what happened when I re what happens when I run simpler y is it literally goes up and runs the code in that definition, sort of from scratch. And so when it gets to the this y, it uh, looks in the global environment, finds y equals 10, and gives that back to me. Now this behavior in R is different than the behavior in, of functions in some languages where the um, the value of y in the local environment would be fixed the first time you ran the function. And then in that case, you would still get 9 out here. So um, this is what you, we call dynamic lookup. I think it's pretty intuitive, but if you're coming from a different um, programming language, it may be uh, maybe less natural. 
I want to illustrate one more point about functions um, before I wrap up this vid, namely that uh, when you rerun a function, it's the environment inside the function starts from scratch every single time. And to do that, I want to use an example that's taken fairly directly from um, Advanced R by Hadley Wickham, which is my primary source, not my only source, but my primary source for this vid. Strongly recommend that book. It's, it's um, very useful all the way through. So I'm going to write another function called add1. And uh, it's going to be a function, again, with no arguments. What I want it to do is first to check if the variable u is defined. And if it's not defined, I want it to assign it to be 0. And if it is defined, then I want, it to, I want to add 1 to it. So the first thing I'm going to need is an if statement. So if it doesn't exist, I need quotes around the object I'm interested in here. Uh, so if it doesn't exist, then let's assign u to be 0. And otherwise, let's let u be u plus 1. And then at the end of it all, I want to return u. OK, so if I execute add 1, we're not going to be at all surprised that we're going to get 0 out. u doesn't exist, so u is assigned to be 0, and then that 0 was printed out. Now, if we rerun this function, we're going to get 0 yet again. So Inside this function environment, you might think that u was assigned to be 0 and that therefore it exists and we would add 1 to it. But the function environment here is sort of created from scratch every time we recreate the function, every time we rerun the function, and then forgotten afterwards. So this u equals 0 from the first time we ran add 1 is forgotten as soon as we're done evaluating the function. And when we rerun the function, it starts from scratch. So we'll just keep getting 0 over and over again if we keep running this function over and over and over again. All right, that's it for today. I hope this helped you understand the structure of our functions a little better, and uh, we'll make your coding practice just a little bit more clear going forward.